Welcome, my name is Jan Libich and I'm really thrilled to be sitting here with Professor John Pickett from the University of New South Wales. Welcome John, uh, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you Jan. Um, we're here to talk about pension economics and retirement financing, which is a very topical area. And, and John has a lot of expertise, both on the research front and on the policy front. Uh, you've advised many governments over the years on, on pension reforms. That's right. Uh, so, so, so let's start with the, with the main problem. What's the main problem with many countries, like countries in continental Europe, their pension system? What, what's all this fuss about? Most countries are now looking at their pension systems and they're looking to change them in some way. And the underlying motivation for that comes from population aging. So population aging has two pieces to it. It's got more than two pieces to it, two important pieces to it. Um, and they are increasing lifespan. So people are now living a lot longer and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and people are having less children and both of those changes in the way human lives are being um, uh, played out and society is being played out, they have a dramatic effect on the institutions we have around pensions and retirement. So what's, what's the problem financially? Uh, does that well, um, uh, many, many countries have uh, very generous uh, pension promises that governments have made and they finance those pension promises from workers. So the workers pay a contribution and then when it comes to retirement uh, they receive a retirement income but the retirement income that they receive is actually being financed by the, uh, by the newer generation, the younger generation of workers who are making their contribution. So we call this pay as you go. And the, so the contribution doesn't actually go to a separate fund or an individual account, it just goes to a common pot of money and... It goes to a common pot of money. Sometimes reserves are built up because you'll go through a period where there are a lot of workers and relatively few retirees uh, and then that might switch and you might have fewer workers and lots of retirees. So there's a build up of reserves through that first period. But that's very different than pre-funding. It's very different from a situation where, where an individual might save uh, assets to accumulate for his retirement. I think that's, that's a, a quite different kind of reserve. So, so due to population aging, if we have few workers and we have a lot more retirees, could it be the situation that uh, someone has contributed all their life towards their pension but then the money dries out and there's, there's really no pension that the government can pay that person? Could that well, hypothetically happen? I think happen? that's very extreme. But I think it's certainly true that uh, in, well, you, you must make a number of distinctions. Let's think about uh, developed economies. For example, you mentioned Europe, developed econ economies in Western Europe or in North America, the US or Canada. Um, what's been happening there is that uh, some of the promises are broken. It's not that you don't get any pension anymore, I don't think that, that's, that's a very unlikely scenario. But for example, pensions are indexed. A lot of pensions were initially indexed to wages, to wage growth. So as wages increased in the community at large, pensions would go up. Then countries switched that and they said, no, we can't afford that. We'll only index to prices. Right? And that, well, that amounts to basically cutting as so if, that's a as form, if there was a form of a pension cut. Right? Or they'll say, um, well, we promised this at age 60, but we can't really afford that anymore, so we're going to move that to 65. Right? Or they'll say, we have this survivor benefit once you die for your spouse, but that used to be three quarters, we'll make that two thirds. Right? Right, so these are all so kind of hidden all ways, kinds of, hidden are ways of reducing the pension liability that, that, that these countries are confronting. And the underlying reason for that is that through either already in some countries like Japan or Germany or Italy or anticipated in other countries like France, uh, there is going to be a financing problem and the only way to solve that financing problem other than by breaking promises is to increase contribution rates. And the increase in contribution rates is going to be a big negative around labour supply. Mm. Right? So countries are now finding themselves kind of between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. with demographic transition. You, you, you mentioned population aging that's kind of underlying a lot of this and you're a director of a 
of an ARC uh, 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 center uh, for population aging research. So can you maybe just outline what the center does and how it feeds through the obviously other areas that we're not going to focus on, other areas like healthcare and other potential uh, consequences, negative consequences of aging? Sure. So. I, I got involved with pension economics in the early 90s and, and by once I'd been in that area for five years it was clear to me this was a multidisciplinary issue um, and it's easy to find examples of that. So the link for example between retirement and health, right? immediately you bring in health care. The link between trying to manage your own financial assets and in retirement and cognitive decline immediately you're looking at economics, you're looking at psychology. The whole question of where increases in life expectancy come from is a demographic question, it's an actuarial question, it's an epidemiological question, not an economic question. And that's very interesting. Let me take that last example. Right? If you take the period between 1950 and 1980, in many countries in the world, right, Life expectancy at birth increased, but life expectancy at age 50 didn't do very much. Between 1980 and 2010, life expectancy at birth has sort of continued to trend up a little. Life expectancy at 50 has exploded. So in Australia's case, between, 19, between 1980 and 2010, life expectancy went up at 50, at age 50, went up by seven years. That's huge. And all of that is pension years. All of that is liability for pensions because it, most of that increase in life expectancy occurs after people expect to retire. And you mentioned Australia and obviously we will talk about the Australian uh, pension or what the, what's called superannuation system uh, a bit later. But just uh, coming back to the main problems uh, in, in that many, many countries are facing, um, what are, the, uh, what are some of the solutions? I mean, the, the World Bank uh, uh, distinguishes these four pillars. So let's talk a little bit more about that uh, and uh, the way it's, it fits into, into the pension reform. Well, um, one possible approach to thinking about it is uh, to think about countries' stages. So um, uh, if you go back a few centuries in Europe, or if you go back half a century in much of Asia, you have economies and social systems where people didn't move very much, where the most important um, source of retirement support, retirement's not very old age support, I suppose you'd call it. People pretty much worked until they couldn't work anymore. Uh, but then they relied on their family. Right? And their family was close by. Okay? That's changed completely. Right? Families now scatter. We have a globalized economy. And with that distance comes a, a weakening of family commitment. So if you take China at the moment, I mean, Asia is very keen on, on promoting the idea of filial piety and support for parents, but that's beginning to break down. How many migrants are there in China? There are 150 million migrants in China, regional migrants, people who've moved out of rural areas into urban areas. Mm -hmm. They send money back home for some time, but it will be a big ask for many of them to return home and look after frail parents. So you need other systems to build in. And as soon as you stop relying on the family and start relying on something else, well, what else is there? Well, there's markets. Markets work very badly unstructured in this area. You can make markets work in certain circumstances, but you need strong governance and you need a strong financial system and you need good government regulation to make that work. And that's, again, one of the challenges at the moment for Australia. If, if you don't have that, the only other way is to have direct government payments. And that's where most countries have gone and they've gone there over the last century. Mm -hmm. 
And, and we should say that the, the idea of the government stepping in and, and looking after the pension system, the idea is the, uh, the government kind of playing the role of a, of a risk manager. There's a, there's a risk that everyone's facing that they'll live for a long time, although it's a, it's a nice type of risk. Uh, and that the, the assets that they might have accumulated are not going to be enough. So the government's kind of insuring people and saying, look, you know, if you die earlier, you're going to contribute more. If you, if, if you live longer, uh, we're, go we're going to look after you. But again, the demographics is kind of making this system uh, un unsustainable. Well, uh, it depends how you do it, but yes, uh, uh, the, the sorts of pension promises, social security promises, if you like, that were made in Germany were very generous and retirement started retirement age, what I think of as, as pension access age, because you often don't have to actually retire. Pension access age started quite early. You know? And people were living very long right, with these very generous pensions, which, which weren't flat rate. They were, they were geared to your final salary or maybe the average of the best 10 years of your career, something like that. Um, uh, and that's, be, that's what's become unsustainable. So Germany at the moment spends 10% of GDP on social security, on pensions. Mm. Right? Well, Australia's figure is more like 3 point Australia's figure is about 3%. Yeah. Right? So that you can see how different that is. Now some of that is Germany's old and we're young. Australia is a younger country, but some of it also is the nature of the promise that is made. And in terms of the ageing, just to, for people to get a sense of the, of the magnitude, if, if we look back 40 years ago, there would have been, say, six, seven workers per one retiree, uh, and that's obviously changed. Now it's more like a, you know, three, four. And what's the, projections for, uh, no. what's the projection for 40 years in, into the future? A number that strikes me is the Japanese number. I mean, it's around, I think, uh, 2.5 now. It will be 1.2 by 2050. 1.2 workers for every retiree. I mean, how can you manage that? That seems just extraordinary. Mm. That is, that, is, that is quite extraordinary. In terms of the, um, you, you, we talked about the World Bank. So let's, let's think about the pillars for people to get an idea where it fits. So we mentioned the pay-as-you-go system. That's generally the first pillar. That's the public pillar. And Australia moved on to put all the emphasis onto the second pillar. Can you briefly describe what it's about? Yeah. Well, the way I like to think about the pillars is the first pillar is around poverty alleviation. And that's almost always government funded. Now, if you do that, in a, in a way that, that is linked with everyone's wages, then high wage people get a lot of money and that's costly to the whatever source it is and it'll be workers' contributions, current workers' contributions in most cases. What we did in Australia was to have a flat rate pension which is set at a level which takes most people out of poverty and in addition, we did something else. So this is the zero pillar in Australia, I think. This yeah, well, I, would, I would call it the first pillar. But I mean, we, th these, there are many different ways of thinking about pillars, right? So I, I, I work with a three pillar system. The first pillar is around um, uh, poverty alleviation. The second pillar is around income replacement. The third pillar is around encouraging further saving through tax breaks, right? So those three pillars. The third pillar is voluntary. The second pillar is some, some sort of compulsory uh, participation in income replacement. The first pillar is po poverty alleviation. Now many countries combine those first two pillars. So they have, a, they have a social security system which is paid out of current tax dollars and which is linked to income. Uh, and then it's kind of got a minimum associated with it. And that's, that's the poverty alleviation piece. But you've got to contribute to belong. So that means if you don't contribute, you fall outside that net, okay? And you still have an old age poverty problem because lots of people fall outside the net. So what we did in Australia, and I'm, I'm a strong advocate of this, is to take that poverty alleviation piece, right? And say, we'll make that flat rate, we'll make it at a level that's just enough to take people out of poverty um, but if we, we will means test it, so if you're very rich, you won't get it. So it's not like many means tests around the world, which is sort of targeting a payment at someone who is destitute. What it does is it excludes the affluent. So I think of it as affluence tested, right? And that saves maybe 
a third of the of the bill mm. relative to something which yes. is flat. And you, you want progressivity built in the system. And there's some progressivity in that. Basically, it's taking a lot of people out of old age poverty, and uh, half the old elderly population get a full pension and a quarter get nothing and a quarter get something in between, roughly speaking, they're the rough numbers. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well for us. And as you said earlier, at the moment that's costing us 3%. And in 2050, even after our population ages, it will cost us 5% or thereabouts of GDP, right? Belgium, by contrast, in 2050 will be paying 17%. Right. So when people say, oh, what we have is unsustainable as a pension system in Australia, I'm never persuaded. Yeah. But again, the, the, the reason it works and the reason the bill is fairly small is because we have the second pillar. Uh, can you describe what, what it's about? Uh, well, yes. I mean, that's actually putting it backwards because we had the first pillar for a long time and no second pillar. Mm. Right? We had that age pension for a long time before we made income-related pensions compulsory. So that only happened in the 80s and 90s. We've had the age pension since 1909, right? which is early on, that not too many countries had anything prior to that. Right? So nine years after Federation, we had a, an age pension system. Right? So it's, 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 worth, it's worth noting that. That's, that's quite an achievement in a way. And we didn't have a population aging problem back then. Though. Back then, <laughs> we did not have a population aging problem. So in terms of the second pillar, uh, how does that work? It's private, it's funded, uh, yeah. goes to so, individual... So in contrast to most OECD countries, I think that's the first thing to say, we, but not, not everywhere, a few countries have this. Uh, we have something which is what, what I think of as pre-funded. So it's, it's, it's compelling individuals to save for their own retirement. And they save through workplace-based and the workplace is compelled to put a proportion of wages into a separate account which is administered by an insurance company or by a wealth management firm, uh, something which is registered and, and that uh, accumulates and then when you reach the point where you need it, which is pretty much after the age, after the age of 60 except in exceptional circumstances, you have a lump sum which you can use towards your retirement. Okay, that's how it works. So this, yeah. this goes under the uh, defined uh, uh, contribution system. There's the it's distinction a between it's defined a de It's a defined contribution system. When we talk about the superannuation guarantee in Australia, the only thing that's guaranteed is the contribution. Not the benefit. Not the benefit, right? Some countries tend to have both contribution defined and the benefit. That's and, right. You know, aging basically makes a discrepancy between the that's two. That's right. So once, that's right. So the, if you if you preordain the benefit relative to salary, and then social or economic circumstances change, like you're going to live for longer or interest rates are lower then the only way you can make that system continue to balance is to vary the contribution. If you've, if you've preset both, you're going to have a system which is unsustainable. Um, and you know, when we talk about the division, there are a, a, a different number of ways that you can have these individual accounts where people or the, the employers put the money to. Uh, this is what we have in Australia is what's called the FDC system, it's the financial uh, so it's the pre-funded system, but some countries have gone the route of, of not having it managed by the private sector, but uh, having these notional or non-financial uh, accounts. How, how does that work? Uh, so it's well, kind of the, like a hybrid the, between the... the non-financial, sometimes called, more commonly called notional defined contribution, um, is usually a place countries go as a way of systematically modifying the unsustainable promises they previously made. Right? So you begin with a defined benefit, pay-as-you-go system, and you've made this promise, and now you realize that demographic change is going to make that promise unsustainable. So you say, we're going to reform the pension system, and what we're going to do instead is we're going to pretend that you have accumulated 
an amount of money through the contributions you make in working life. And we're going to come up with a, a notional asset value at the end of your working life. And then we're going to pretend that you buy an annuity and we will price that annuity in terms of your life expectancy then, in terms of prevailing interest rates and so forth. And whatever that is, that's what we'll give you. So no longer are we making a defined benefit promise, we're making a promise based upon a notional accumulation. Right? So that's why it's called notional defined contribution. I mean, the, the money uh, may still not be there. The money right? is not there. But the at, least, at least people know how much they've contributed. To the system. They know how much they've contributed. What they don't know is how much they're going to get. And so it's a, it's a more systematic way of, of doing the reforms that other countries have done in the way that I was describing earlier, by raising retirement age, by changing the indexation or the survivor benefit. Instead of doing that, you're saying, well, now it's all up for grabs. We're going to pretend this is in the market and offer you what the market might have offered. And the, the advantage of doing it more systematically is that you can have some kind of inbuilt mechanism. Some countries have like a reserve, reserve fund. Some countries have a, a balancing right. mechanism where That's you right. Can you kind of just so what happens there those? is that those countries say, well, we're not going to leave this completely up to the market. So if interest rates go down, we're not going to reduce your annuity payment automatically. However, right, if things get too bad, we'll introduce this balancing mechanism where everything suddenly gets changed. So Japan, I think, has done that. Mm -hmm. um, Sweden. Sweden has done that, yeah. So how does it work? So when you, 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 you add up all the liabilities of the system, you add up all the, all the assets, and if the liabilities yeah, if exceed the, the assets, by some there's a margin, cut. I yeah. think, then yeah. there's some kind of a cut. There's a cut across the board. That's right. Uh, and, I mean, some people argue that the system where the government gets involved might be, in some ways, might be superior, maybe cheaper. I, uh, three weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Bruce Chapman, who was the architect of the Australian uh, system of uh, uh, government-run uh, student loans that are contingent on income. And, uh, and one of the advantages of the system is that the, the government, because they, uh, the government can do it in bulk, and because it can use the, the existing tax system for collection and so on, it does it much more cheaply than if the student loans are financed through, through private banks. Indeed. So, so and and I, think, I think the private system that we have is expensive in terms of um, the administrative burden. What are the, what are the average costs of, of oh, they, pension they funds vary in Australia? A lot. Uh, uh, numbers like 1% oh. come to mind, yeah. but I wouldn't like to be... Uh, that needs to be checked because there's a, there's a, there's a large range of um, uh, costs associated. Um, and one reason that there's a large range of costs is we're pushing, we're pushing individuals to take more control. And this is something that's happening worldwide, individual responsibility for their own retirement. That means they've got to know stuff they never used to have to know. And so there is an advice market. So an important reason why some of these are expensive and others cheap is that the expensive ones usually come with advice. Now the advice may not be good, it might be, but it mightn't be. But I think that's an important component of the underlying cost, which is missing in the cheaper funds, which is kind of, you are guys, this is mm -hmm. what it is. That's true, uh, and uh, it seems like uh, another part of the, the cost is the fact that there's usually active um, asset management on the part of the, the funds. Yes, that doesn't and, always happen, but that's true. And you know, some, some of the critics of the system say that there should be a, a lot more emphasis on using some index, passive index, investment index, index funds and so on. And, and I, think, I think there's probably some, I think, I think, I think there's good sense to that, um, because administrative costs can make quite a big difference. They don't sound like a lot because they're expressed as a proportion of assets, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, that means actually that they're a deduction from the rate of return. Uh, so if you have a system which is offering you, let's say, 5%, um, and then you add on an extra 1% of costs, mm. so now it's 4%. That, and you that talk can make, nominal, that can so make, in real terms that might be, uh, you know, if you yeah, have inflation, yeah, yeah, that might be real, so you might be going terms. from from 2 to 1. Mm -hmm. right? So, so you, you get to retirement, it can make a difference of 30% in how much accumulation you've accumulated, just that one percentage point difference. So it, it's, um, uh, it, it's more significant than people think.
And it is, I think, a legitimate reservation about the arrangement that we've come to here. And let's, let's think, uh, you know, there, there might be some potential other uh, disadvantages that we might uh, talk about later, but let's, let's think about the advantages of the system compared to an unfunded pay-as-you-go system. So we mentioned the transparency, people can see how much they've set up and so on. Are there any other well, advantages? Well, I think the important, for me, the important advantage is its sustainability. And as I said earlier, I mean, I, when people tell me that the system is not sustainable, I can't really believe it when you look at these comparative numbers. Um, I think what we have is a system which is sustainable for half a century, maybe longer, maybe a century, um, over which time fertility behaviour could alter dramatically. Right? I mean, n there are assumptions made about what fertility will be like in, I don't know, 2050 or 2080, but you're talking about the fertility behaviour of women who have yet to be born. So I think they might go very, back to having four, four or five kids. Risky, uh, a very risky thing to do, yeah. Well, I, I think uh, sometimes people criticize these uh, predictions for aging, saying that they're kind of based on some shaky numbers. But it seems to be one of the most robust facts in economics that w when people get more prosperous, uh, in other words, they get more income, uh, fertility uh, rates go down. And, and there's been a, an, an immense uh, change of the world. In, even countries that we always thought about as, as low income and you know, high fertility countries now have basically half Bangladesh, I think, have now two and a half kids per family and, uh, you know, and going up from five and, uh, just 20 years ago. So, I mean, the whole world is, just, is a very different place compared to what, what it was 30 years ago in terms of fertility. Yeah. So there, I think there are, uh, I think I th there's never really been a comprehensive study to explain why fertility rates decline in different countries at different times. So everyone knows that Japan is the oldest economy in the world. The reason is its fertility plummeted in 1952 or 1953. Right? So why did it plummet then and not 10 years later like in Australia? Well, that's not clear. Right? And it would be very interesting, I think, to, to try to put together a study which looked at the timing of fertility declines through the world, around the world, because that would tell us a lot about what the underlying causes of fertility are. Um, uh, so that's that. But you're right that, that population ageing is a global phenomenon, that median age is going up in almost every country in the world, and that the two reasons for that are people are living longer and they're having less kids. That's, they're, that's certainly the case. Now, it seems, whether, have, yeah, go on. it seems to have implications for other areas, not just pensions, but financial markets oh, uh, yeah. um, and, and you know, health care, housing markets and so on. And we might discuss those a bit later, but uh, going back to the advantages of the system, it seems like it's, it's a lot more flexible. So you can choose your um, a fund that you're going to uh, accumulate your savings through. You can choose the investment strategy, so people that are, that are more risk averse uh, can kind of uh, be more conservative in their investment. There, there seem to be, you know, you can retire earlier if you have if you have accumulated enough assets, you can retire earlier. Can you think of some? It is more flexible. It's uh, flexibility is other things equal good, right? There's a lot of evidence, though, that people aren't all that wonderful at committing to things that are a long way off, right? Um, and uh, we all know, we all know, right? I, I gave a talk at, at HKU. And it's last getting week. worse, actually. I think uh, a generation ago, people were uh, a, a little more, bit more, more patient and had a lower discount. Now, right? Yeah, yeah. I gave a talk. I gave a talk at HKU UST last week, and I said, look. Um, you know, if I ask you before, I, before this session begins whether you're going to have an apple or a chocolate brownie at morning tea, you'll tell me an apple. When you go out at morning tea time, you'll have the chocolate brownie. Right? So the, the idea of committing in advance right, is at odds with flexibility. So I think that's one reason why we have these kinds of structures. If we, if, if we really believed people made optimal decisions throughout their whole lives, then social security would not exist. Yeah. This, right? this is one of the uh, things that the critics point out. You know, why do we need the government to get involved in the place? Yeah. Why, why do they have to mandate 
uh, people's savings. But yeah. uh, uh, well, I think so that, it's I the think psychology, that, is it because that's we're the impatient? Reason. I think that's the reason. Well, impatient and, I mean, in some ways we know we'd be prepared to pay something to organize a commitment to the future, right? And that's kind of what we're doing with social security and kind of what we're doing with the Australian system. You say, well, it's costly. Yes, it is. But it does ensure that there's something there when you're 65. Mm. Um, and, and I think increasingly uh, it's going to be there's something there when you're 80. And that's a whole new issue around cognitive decline and how we do that. That's a, an open area of policy debate. One of the things that get debated about the uh, the Australian system is is whether it's fair. Is it fair that uh, w when someone passes away prematurely, uh, the family can inherit it? Uh, is is it a good thing or is it a is it a bad thing? Is it? Uh, I find it, I find I'm 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 an advocate of greater equality, and if you came to me with a credible proposal to increase age pension benefits, for example, or to say that instead of the top quarter not getting it, maybe the top third should not get it. I think uh, you'd be able to persuade me if the case was a reasonable one. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of that. I think, I think there are two pieces that people miss in this whole question of inequality. The first is that if you take transfers in gen taxes and transfers generally in Australia uh, and you compare how the dollars go from rich to poor between Australia and other OECD countries, we are far and away the best. We are the most efficient at getting rich tax dollars into the hands of the poor. And an important reason for that is we do not have conventional social security which pays benefits to rich people. Right? So that's an important reason, not the only reason why, but it's an important reason why. I think it says something about how bad the other systems are because there's a lot of middle class welfare in Australia. That's there's true. a lot of people yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying, we're perfect. Uh, I'm not saying we're perfect by any means. We're not. And there's a huge room for improvement. And I agree about middle class welfare that we could do more to rein that in. I, I, I agree with that entirely. But I get, I find that the, the um, much of the debate around inequality and retirement incomes in Australia uh, rests on the notion of tax expenditures associated with superannuation payments. So superannuation is tax preferred. And the tax estimates, the tax expenditure estimates that are generated presume that the best system or the benchmark system is a comprehensive income tax. Well, it just isn't, right? We don't want a comprehensive income tax and it's never existed anywhere, and countries which have tried to approximate it have done badly. It, it is, it, it's extremely bad for growth. It's extremely bad for asset allocation. Because of the labor market distortions? Yeah, uh, well, because it, it, it messes up the ways in which different assets are taxed. So owner-occupier housing, for example, is always omitted. So if you, that's a major life cycle asset. So if you tax the only other major life cycle asset, which is your pension accumulation, differently, very differently, then people will move into housing. And, and that happens. So the housing market goes out of control then. Right? You, you need a system which recognises that there is some kinds of saving and investment which is for your retirement. It's not for a trip next year or something. It's for your retirement. And that needs to be treated where the tax system does not distort the prices of that future consumption from the price of your present consumption. To do that, you need not a tax on income, but a tax on expenditure. Once you do that, these enormous numbers that people quote as to the cost or the lack of sustainability of the superannuation system goes away. Not completely, and we could improve it. We could make it more like an expenditure tax than it is. But the vast bulk of it, the, the, the big quantitative weight of that argument goes away. Mm. And I think that's the second thing that's missed. There are those two pieces. First of all, overall we do well, comparatively speaking, in getting rich tax dollars to, poor, to the poor in terms of transfers. And secondly, we should not be using comprehensive income as a benchmark to measure the tax cost of superannuation or owner-occupier. And it's true that uh, 
the general sales tax and some kind of indirect taxes are much bigger as a proportion of the tax revenue in countries like Europe, That's true. Uh, in, in many European countries, than they are in Australia. That's so there's true. More and we could use more of that. We're going to have to use more of that because we're going to need more taxes with an aging population. Whether it's health or pensions or whatever, we're going to need more. And we're going to have to increase those. I think we will have to increase consumption taxes such as the GST. As, as part of the flexibility of the system that we mentioned, you can actually choose your investment strategy. It, it seems, and one thing that always puzzles me, and there's an academic literature on that, is, is, the, uh, is the bias that people tend to invest more into domestic asset as opposed to uh, uh, the bias. foreign asset, the, the home bias. Uh, uh, is, is it the case in Australia? Yes. And why is it, and is it a problem? It's less of a case in Australia than it is in many other countries. Uh, it can be a problem. It's, I think uh, it happens in Australia for two reasons. First of all, we have a corporate tax which pays dividend imputation to Australians, right. not to people overseas. So there's a, a kind of tax advantage to buying an Australian equity mm -hmm. relative to a foreign equity. That's the first thing, foreign share. Um, the second thing is that when you buy, when you put, for example, if a superannuation fund decides to invest very heavily overseas, then it faces exchange rate risk. Now, you can cover exchange rate risk, you can hedge it in a short period, you can hedge it for a year or three years, but often the assets and liability matching are around 30 years. They're, they're a 40-year-old who's going to need this when he's 65, yeah. right? So you don't want to take too much risk on the exchange rate when that's the pattern of liabilities you're going to have to meet. Mm. Now, it's probably the case that it would be better if we invested more broadly than we do, um, but they're the two reasons why I think there is this home bias that you observe in Australia. And I mean, Australia doesn't face uh, an immediate risk, but it's, it's, if we go back a, a few months or years ago, uh, looking at countries like Greece or Cyprus, it seems like uh, uh, th there was a big problem in, in the sense that the countries have, a, have some kind of weakness. Most countries have a, have a weakness, uh, like uh, the, the, the banking system in Cyprus or the welfare system in Greece. And it, it seems like when you have a pay-as-you-go pension system, that uh, where uh, all the assets are kind of uh, it, it's almost uh, accounts to uh, investing domestically because the money is just not invested. If they had a capital accumulation pension system that was invested overseas, then you know the country might get in trouble. People might lose a, a job. They might lose their income. But at least they would not lose the uh, you know the the pension that is invested overseas. So this is an adv another advantage of the capital accumulation system. It kind of ensures you against some of the country risks when you I diversify. I think that's true. I think that, that's, that's a fair point. I think there's something to be said for what I call system diversity. So if this first poverty alleviation pillar, if you're relying for the government on that, right, then on the government for that, then maybe it's worth relying on the market for the second piece and then the government could let you down or the market could let you down, but maybe they both won't let you down. Uh, so it gives you a bit of risk diversification like that. So if you, if you could design um, a pension system from scratch to some country, what kind of attributes would it have? You mentioned that there would probably be a combination of the public and the private. System. I think that's the first thing. Um, and I think, um, I think our tax system is very messy in Australia and I think the way we deal with distribution or drawdown or decumulation has, is just not present. I mean, we need to do a lot more work in policy there. But if you fix those two things up, the broad design of the Australian system is very close to what I would advocate if I was starting de novo. Um, so I'd, I'd have a flat rate pension which is non-contributory like the Australian age pension. So you don't have to be a member or pay anything. It's there if you are resident for some period of years. So we don't have people coming and living for six months and picking it up. I think the figure in Australia is 10 years. Regi resident for 10 years, you're entitled to this subject to the other means that you might have. I think that makes good sense to me. I think then that you need pretty tight tapers. 
Um, so you need to set this at a minimum level which takes people out of poverty. And then you need, when you get to it, you need a tight taper that is probably tighter than we have now. It could be 60 or 70 percent. The reason for that, I know people say, well, that's very high effective marginal tax rate. But what it is, is it's affecting fewer and fewer people. The tighter you have it, the fewer people are around that income area. Probably not 100 percent, but it could be tightened. So that would be the first piece that I would have. I would index it. I think it should be indexed to wages, the, the payment, but the age should be indexed to life expectancy at 60 or at 65. Right? Not at what? birth. Not at birth, right? So suddenly increases in life expectancy, then I think you need to, you need to take account of that. Right? So retirement age gradually goes up as life expectancy goes up. Not the amount that's paid, but the access age. I think that needs to be indexed. So that's where I would begin. And then I think I, I would have a, a system not that dissimilar from ours, um, but I would have the specification of the payment as the amount going into the account. So we have 9% going to 12% at the moment uh, of wages, but that's the payment that the employer makes to the insurance company or to the fund then fees are taken out of that before it ends up in the account. Right? So I, I think it's better to specify, instead of 12%, you specify 10%, let's say, but the 10% is, the, is net, the 10% ends up in the account. Right? Mm -hmm. And so far, there are no taxes. And there are no taxes on the earnings either, so the fund goes away and earns and invests your money, and that happens, and then when you retire, you pay tax, you pay an income tax on whatever you draw out. So it's just treated under the normal income tax. And that way you get progressivity, you get a taxation of the benefit, um, and you get, in a situation where you, get, uh, where you have a, a demographic change, the government is picking up revenue from those benefits at the same time that it's facing liabilities for things like healthcare. So I think there are some, so we don't have that system, we have a different kind of tax system. We don't do anything about the income stream in retirement, which is another piece that I think we should have better income streams than we currently have. Exactly how I don't know, but there should be more than we have. Uh, so I think those things I would, I would have as part of it. Right? But that's, uh, I think we've got the building blocks, uh, much of that in Australia now. And how can a country that already has some system, generally the pay-as-you-go, uh, first pillar, how can it successfully move mm. on to this? I mean, Australia, Australia did that more than 20 years ago and it somehow Well, worked, Australia didn't have a social security system. It had this age pension, it had that flat rate. It never had to replace a social security system with something pre-funded and that was a huge advantage for us. Mm. Now, two other countries, three other countries have done something similar and they've done it from scratch, pretty much. So the Netherlands and Switzerland both have pre-funding and they both pretty much did it from the beginning. Um, Chile is a country which has started with a social security system and changed it around, right? And um, it's getting there. It's better than it was, right? But it's been very hard. And I think some of the reasons it's been hard in Chile relate to its stage of development. So st although Chile is a middle income country and, and coming along well, it's got quite a large informal sector. And people noted that when they converted, they gave what they called recognition bonds to people who'd made some payments into the old social security system. So you began with an asset in the new DC system. Um, and then that, that accumulated further with your contributions. And people looked at these contributions and said, oh, membership is very high but they didn't look at what's called the density of contributions. So people would work for a few months in the formal sector, and then they would go and work in the cash economy for a few years, and they'd come back and work for a few months. So when it came to maturity time, which takes 20 years, right, and people started looking at payouts, the payouts were virtually nothing because people had not contributed continuously for the 20 years as everyone had assumed they would, they contributed for three or four. 
so you've identified one of the important prerequisites for the system to work, and that's uh, the country having you know stable and transparent institutions uh, that actually work. You know, yeah. good taxes. I, and I think I think actually that's true mm. in both in both a uh, pay-as-you-go system and in a pre-funded system. So pay-as-you-go systems can be completely messed up uh, by governments, and they have been, particularly in the developing world, but we've talked about how promises have been compromised in the developed world as well. Um, so that can happen without strong governance, and then um, I think that unless you have strong governance around the financial sector, and considerable financial sophistication that these very long-term contracts on investment and saving that you're talking about with retirement income are very difficult to guarantee. And that's, that's precisely why many countries that are trying to move in that direction towards sustainability and have implemented some second pillar Australian type of uh, system, they, they seem to be uh, uh, backtracking now and you know, Poland's kind of reversing the policy. Czech Republic, yeah. my home country, they've implemented the system and, and now they've kind of basically scrapped it. So it seems there's a lot of political opposition people, uh, uh, partly also because some, some people are worried that the, uh, if, it, if it's run by the private sector, there's always this uh, danger of bankruptcies and you know, someone kind of running away with the money and, and that sort of thing. Well, so uh, I, think, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think, there is, uh, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, the countries you mentioned, this has happened several times. Um, uh, I think there are, there's a combination of reasons for that. Uh, the, the first is that probably they did not have sufficiently strong governance or financial sophistication to actually manage it, or maybe even political maturity, you know? Mm -hmm. So in, in, there have been cases where governments have expropriated the assets that have been accumulated and simply moved them back into consolidated revenue. The other thing is that many of these countries started this system in the first half of the 2000s and they just got going and the financial crisis hit. So it was very inopportune timing. Maybe if it had happened at the beginning of the 90s, then things would have developed differently. Hmm. I, I, and I should mention that you've actually advised a number of governments on, on these matters. You worked with the government of Japan for more than 10 years, and, yeah, and Russia so and Indonesia. Some of the a lot of that is just information provision, but in the case of Russia, for example, they, they wanted a, a system of benefits, um, which took out, took out the systematic risk, and so it was a quite complicated thing to design. Um, I don't think it was ever implemented, because I think the pension system moved on, but that, that, was the, that was the assignment that I was given, and it was very interesting to do. I mean, I learned a lot about Russia, and I learned a lot about the Russian pension system, and I learned a lot about pension economics, and, and that, never, that problem had never really been analyzed properly previously. So let's, uh, we're rapidly running out of time, so let's look at some of the other uh, aspects of uh, population aging. Um, what about financial markets, housing markets, and, and maybe healthcare? These are the three areas that we can yeah. briefly talk about. What are going to be the implications of aging? Well, there are two stories about asset pricing. One is um, that the old own the assets, and uh, if you take the case of housing, they've, they've expropriated those assets to themselves, and house prices have gone up, and the ge that generation has benefited at the cost of younger generations because now it's impossible to buy into mature housing markets in large cities. Is, is that narrative accurate? Or? It's, um, there are examples. I don't know how much it's a plot. I mean, it's just something that has happened. In the Australian case, I think the, that a lot of it lies on the supply side uh, and that we need to radically rethink things like zoning and density of, uh, and, and the associated infrastructure. And then I think housing would become more affordable. We're, we're in an unusual situation in having an economy which is very agglomerized, which there are only four cities and people, or everyone wants to live in those four cities. So the, the site rents around housing are extremely high. So that, that's, and then there's and a story And this is partly the reason why, uh, unlike in most countries where after 2008 pro property prices fell quite dramatically. I mean, that didn't really happen here. It didn't happen well, Australia, suffered, Australia did better out of the global financial crisis or survived it better than many other countries. Um, that's true. Uh, the housing market itself, 
had not gone through a boom. So if you looked at the US, the housing prices actually went up quite rapidly prior to 2008. If you look at the Sydney market, for example, it hadn't gone up much at all in the five years prior to the crisis. So it was probably, maybe, maybe the, the increase in prices we've seen in the last year would have occurred two or three years earlier without the crisis. Right? Mm -hmm. But there was room for an upward adjustment, and so I think that helped cushion mm. potential Especially falls. relative to income, because inf incomes were rising faster incomes in Australia than in the US. Incomes were rising very so fast in Australia. Yeah. Financial assets, I'm not sure. It seems to me that there are many opportunities for investment with high returns. Um, I, think, I think the broader long-term story on population ageing, the verdict isn't in. So what happens when global population starts shrinking, supposing fertility is as people project and that starts occurring at the end of the century. Uh, is there going to be the same demand for new capital that there is now? Mm. Right? For the moment, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't subscribe to the asset meltdown scenario. Can, really. can you briefly outline what that was? Well, the idea is, the idea is that um, the baby boomers have accumulated assets for their retirement. Now they're going to spend them down. The only, re the only way they can spend them down is to sell them. And so uh, the the market for these assets will become a buyer's market because everyone will be seeking to sell and the prices will plummet and that will mean that the, what people thought of as have, thought they had, which was enough assets, enough wealth to go through their retirement years, will not be there any longer. That's this this hypothesis, in fact, I was, I was told by some of my German colleagues that when, when a reform, a pension reform was uh, being discussed, this was one of the, the counter-arguments going, okay, well, we're going to have all these private funds and so on, but the, because the price of assets is going to decrease dramatically, it is basically going to face the same kind yeah. of problems as the, as the public I think, system. I think it's, uh, you know, as I said near the beginning, we, we, this is a very globalised economy we're operating in, and although population is occurring everywhere, it's occurring at very different rates and at very different stages. And so I think there are uh, opportunities for investment in Asia. I mean, look at Asia, right? There's, there's decades of investment in Asia before the marginal return on capital declines to a point where you would have an asset meltdown. Mm. Now, it might be true in Germany if it was just a national mm. market, right? But I think in a global market, it's very unlikely. I agree. I've, I've seen uh, several studies that basically show that the asset meltdown hypothesis might be correct in theory, but uh, quantitatively, it's just going to lead to a very small pitch. reduction in the re yeah. returns. What, what about healthcare, just to finish up? Well, are there any lessons from the pension reforms onto healthcare, which seems to be a big problem uh, in many countries? Uh, healthcare is. Healthcare is important, and it's a major part of expenditure. Um, a government expenditure. And I think, I think the basic story is that in order to continue to provide health care which is commensurate with where technology is, right? this, this is partially techni technologically driven as well, that tax increases are inevitable. I really don't see a way around, I don't see, it's very difficult to pre-fund health care uh, once again, I'm not opposed to the arrangement in Australia where uh, a private insurance option is available that people can take up and relieve a little bit of the pressure on the public system. But eventually you have a healthcare system which delivers to the populace and the primary funder of that is going to be the taxpayer. The taxpayer, of course, is the primary beneficiary as well. Right? And I think that needs to be taken into account. Um, something else along that same theme is that new uh, uh, policy imperatives will grow with population ageing and an important one would be aged care. So long term care or aged care is something which um, this country has not paid much attention to until recently and then a year or two ago we had an aged care policy and that's I guess proceeding and gradually um, uh, being developed over the next 10 years. Not a moment too soon, but actually in time. Right? Um, and uh, there are going to be these areas, I think, where, where there will be new demands on the public purse as a result of the aging demographic. Take cognitive decline. Um, here is an area where for financial commitments, for people making their own decisions late in life, 
cognitive decline, I'm not really talking about dementia, although that's a piece of it, but just people not being able to figure things out so well when they're 80 as when they're 60 mm -hmm. or when they're 40, that, that, that's going to mean that perhaps there's room for a policy of pre-commitment at late age. So Germany has this, this pre-funded pension that you alluded to, the Riester pension. And part of that is whatever, whatever else you do with your benefits, you have considerable freedom over your benefits, right? but there's a piece that has to be preserved to age 85, and then it's a pension, and that's to cope with cognitive decline. So that's another element of population aging where you get this interaction between health, psychology, economics, finance. It seems like ageing has uh, many different facets very, and it's going to influence it's, it's, uh, our society. I'd say in many climate change ways. and population ageing are going to be the two 21st century stories, really. Yeah, I Socially, think from a social point of view. The, the World Economic Forum has this uh, barometer of, of global risks, and I think fiscal crisis is, is number one uh, in terms of the impact, financial impact, and, and global warming is number two. So, there you go. Uh, uh, Professor John Figgett, thank you very much for your time and for your ongoing contribution, not only to the research on population aging and pensions, but also in the policy making arena. And let's hope countries will be able to work it out uh, and, and uh, achieve sustainable pension systems. Let me wish you all the best for the future and thank right. you again. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you.